A large part of enjoying Nier is piecing together clues of how the world came to its current state. If you haven't gotten to ending B yet, but plan to, you should not watch this video. We're going to be talking about massive spoilers from beginning to end. I don't want a YouTube video to be the way you find out that the Shadow Lord is actually the boy from the abandoned grocery store at the beginning of the game, and that if the story was centered on him instead of Replicant Nier, the plot would be too upsetting to endure. That would hurt your experience. If you thought Nier was a sad story from the perspective of the protagonists, check out the Shadow Lord situation. He suffered over a millennium of solitude just to give his sister, daughter, sister the long, natural life she deserved. But the body prepared for her was buggy, not to mention used, so she was like, thanks but no thanks, and he was like, come on, really, if you give that body up you'll die immediately, which she did, and he was like, wow, this day couldn't get any worse, and then his body executed him. So keep all that in mind as we go into this discussion about the music, because the Shadow Lord's theme uses many, many methods to create a sound that is heroic, divine, sinister, and heartbreaking all at once. Like every other part of the newer soundtrack, Kuniyuki Takahashi's arrangement of Shadow Lord gives a lot more attention to the orchestra than we heard in the original game. And I absolutely see why many fans think that was the wrong call for the world of Nier, but I think it does some really cool stuff and I want to talk about the cool stuff, so we're going to talk about it. Just to be clear, the remake still had Keiichi Okabe at the helm. He just delegated a lot of the arrangements to members of his studio, including Kuniyuki Takahashi. So when the orchestra comes in later in the piece, it's mostly Takahashi's voice we're hearing. There's a lot going on in this piece. To keep things straight, we'll chop the music into four sections. Section A is like the verse, if one were to compare it to pop song structure. It's the first thing we hear, and it introduces all of the main concepts of the piece so that they can be used more dramatically later on without taking us too much by surprise. Section B can be thought of as the chorus or hook, and it uses the tool's first scene in Section A to weave the core identity of the piece. Section C is like the post-chorus. It rides the energy of Section B to a very strong release, and alters the overall feel into something even more emotionally conflicted. We don't hear Section D until halfway through the fight, and it's relatively simple. It works well as a bridge. Shadow Lord is written in the style of hymns and classical music. The Shadow Lord himself is like a dark angel, a martyr, savior, and threat, all in one. The choir and pipe organ, somber chords, and even the tiling in his chamber give him a strange holiness. The music theory also references classical music throughout. So just by association, any listener familiar with historic Western music will right away feel an ironic divinity, even sophistication, coming from the Shadow Lord. There are three main tools this piece uses to bend the rules of its key, and they're responsible for perhaps most of Shadow Lord's staying power. The three tools are the leading tone, secondary dominance, and the relative key. All three show up in Section A to foreshadow more complex and exciting uses deeper in. We'll examine them all up front, so that as the piece gains momentum, we'll have to stop for explanations less and less. Sound good? Oh, it will. Immediately after the piece establishes its key, F minor, it starts finding ways to leave it. Nice. You know a chord is going to sound fun when its pitches are so close they have to switch sides. This pitch at the top is E natural. Normally E's are flat in F minor, not natural. So why use E natural here? Because it sounds good! Okay, but why? Uh... E natural is the leading tone of F. Every musical key is named after a note. That note is called the tonic, and it's the foundational pitch of the music, often the starting point and almost always the destination. The leading tone is the note right below the tonic. Leading tones are present in major scales, but not minor ones, so since our piece is minor, the leading tone is an accidental, a note from outside the F minor scale used to build the piece. The amount of tension that little change adds is pretty staggering. You hear the leading tone in classical music all the time, used as a way to deepen the satisfaction of the following arrival point, because it makes the listener even hungrier for resolution. So whenever we see it, we know it's there to strengthen an F chord in the near future, usually in the very next measure. Now you may be thinking, that was honestly not very impressive given how long you talked about it. Yeah, it's foreshadowing. It's included here to help us accept E natural as a part of this piece so that it can be used in way cooler effects later on without disorienting the listener. 
music theory is a lot like storytelling in that way. Every key has seven chords associated with it. The fifth one is called the dominant chord. In major keys it contains the leading tone, and that, among other reasons, is why it's very effective at strengthening the next point of resolution we hear on the tonic, the note in the name of the key. A cool, but kind of confusing application of this is the secondary dominant. We see our first secondary dominant about halfway through section A. It's this G major chord. Ah oh, yeah, major means happy. Why does it sound like that? Well, because it's way out of key. Look at that, every single pitch in the supporting choir is an accidental. And even the melody is on arguably the weakest pitch of the F minor scale, the second one. G major is here for one reason. It's the dominant chord of C major, and this phrase ends on a C major chord. C major carries a lot of tension in F minor, since it doesn't have the tonic and does have the leading tone, which isn't even in key. Using G major as a secondary dominant here gives C more power to resolve tension, especially since C's leading tone, B natural, is being sung in two different octaves. So although it sounds backwards, bringing this wildly inappropriate chord into the piece makes the end of the phrase sound a little smoother in comparison. It's a very classical sound. Virtually none of us knew that Shadow Lord was in F minor the first time we heard it, but we understood that it was. Based on the chords and harmonies, our minds created expectations for the piece without us even thinking about it, and those expectations are called F minor. And a lot of that has to do with which chords we hear, but some of it is when we hear them. Because guess what? F minor isn't the only key made from these seven pitches. All of the pitches in every minor key are also the seven pitches of one major key, and vice versa. These pairs of keys are said to be relative. It may seem impossible that playing the same notes in the same order could sound minor one way and major another just by changing what note you start on, but yeah, sometimes the world doesn't make sense. In Shadow Lord, Okabe works really hard to blur the line between F minor and A flat major. These three chords, are the chords you'd most expect to find at the end of any four-measure phrase in F minor. A flat major mostly ends phrases in these three chords. Watch what happens to the chords toward the end of section A. Keep in mind this is more foreshadowing of the storm to come. Do you hear that warmth in measures 11 and 12? It starts in measure 11, but if the phrase ended on F minor, you wouldn't even notice it. It gets shut down too fast. But since the phrase ends on A flat major, the tonic chord of the relative key, it blossoms into this major sound, even though there are no accidentals. Or rather, because there are no accidentals. You remember how gross G major and C major sound in this key. And then at the end, we finally hit the first really solid resolution since we started. Look at that, C major into F minor, the dominant into the tonic. And that's section A, by far the hardest because we had to establish so much. When I was working on this video, I knew I was missing something, so I asked composers Benjamin Palman and David Kautz for help. That's the only reason I know what a secondary dominant is. Thank you both, I'm confident I would have made a much shallower video without you. And thank you as well to my awesome patrons who are helping me find more time to make videos like these. If you want to join them and vote on future video topics, the link is in the description. Back to you, me. Thanks, me. Section B starts with one of the most dramatic moments of the piece. It technically starts at the end of section A. We'll listen to the end of A and the beginning of B together, and then talk about the seven different things contributing to this hallelujah moment.
This is the first time we hear an A natural in the piece. It doesn't belong to F minor or A flat major, so it takes us completely off guard. Even though it comes at the end of section A, it's in what's known as the pickup to section B. It's an honorary member of the next phrase that comes after the current one has already been resolved on this long F minor. This is a secondary dominant. It's F major. F is the dominant of B flat, so it boosts the resolution on the B flat chord in the next measure. Unlike the C major chord that the last secondary dominant set up, this chord is completely in key for F minor, and even has F in it. Not only that, but F is the highest pitch in the chord, and the melody doubles it an octave higher, so it's extremely pronounced. This resolution hits really hard, because both F and B flat have been set up as arrival points. It's such a glorious moment that it sounds major, even though it's not. But for the first brief moment, it isn't minor either. This measure starts out on just B flat, C, and F, all of which are in both F major and F minor. It's not until two counts in that this D flat confirms we're still in F minor. Usually we would assume that we were because that's the key we've been in for the whole piece, but since the previous chord was that F major secondary dominant, it's briefly ambiguous if the key has changed to major or not. The melody hits the highest note we've heard so far, which increases the emotional weight it carries. That pairs really well with it being the tonic pitch F. The supporting choir opens up to sing on awe, the warmest, most open vowel the human voice can make. And of course, that organ comes in. Who could miss it? Seven things happening in one moment to create the most complex emotional effect we've yet looked at on this channel. It only seems appropriate for Replicant Nier's face-off with the Shadow Lord. <laughs> The second measure of section B is an E flat major chord, and the third an A flat major chord. Going directly from the ambiguity we just talked about into these two major chords has a wonderful effect. The phrase starts and ends on minor chords common to F minor, but the two measures in the middle are major chords common to A flat major. This is one of the places in the piece that the two relative keys are both being used at once, and it's beautifully shown in the top line of the supporting choir. If we isolate it, It's a very simple minor progression, one, two, three, one. But because the two measures in the middle have the dominant and tonic chords for the relative key, there's another way to interpret this. In F minor, G and A flat are the second and third degrees, but in A flat major, they're the leading tone and the tonic. So this choir part resolves twice in the same phrase, once in A flat major in the third measure, and once in F minor in the fourth. The rest of section B continues to bob and weave between F minor and A flat major for a while. Then at the end, it pours a bunch of tension into this C major chord. Usually phrases end with resolution, but resolution can sometimes come right at the start of a new phrase. That's sort of what happens here. After this C major, there's a short segue into the first phase of the boss fight. It serves as a kind of bookend to section B. First it repeats the last two measures down an octave while avoiding the tonic to hold on to the tension. It's super ominous and feels more like an extension to the previous phrase than the beginning of a new one. Because that's essentially what it is. Finally, we come to rest on a long F minor chord that effectively ends this version of the piece. While you fight Grimoire Noir and then the first phase of the Shadow Lord, sections A and B repeat fairly unchanged. They're just faster now, and obviously there's driving percussion carrying the tempo. And at section B, that percussion rises in pitch, changing the color of the rhythm and making that point in the music feel like even more of a transcendence. <laughs> in 
Instead of going into that segue after B, now we continue into section C. But I want to talk about section C in tandem with the next cutscene, so for now we'll skip that part to this cool organ solo over section A's chord progression. Replicant Nier is actually doing a pretty good job beating the crap out of the Shadow Lord, but a voice stops him cold, and the music vanishes. Wait! <gasps> it's Yona. She's unsteady on her feet, crippled by the Black Scrawl, but she has to reach her brother to stop the violence. Only her brother isn't Replicant Nier. It's the Shadow Lord. As she begins to speak to him, the music fades in very slowly. This is Replicant Yona's body, yes but it's being controlled by the original Yona, the Shadow Lord's sister who first touched Grimoire Noir in that grocery store over a thousand years ago. Wow, what a sentence. She doesn't want the bodies and lives he's been fighting for. She hears replicant Yona inside her, crying to be let out and to see her brother, and the original Yona can't bear to take this girl's life away from her, even if her only alternative is her own death. Then, Slowly, she turns to Nier, and as his eyes meet hers for the first time in five years, we arrive at the swell that begins Section B. It's you, isn't it? Against that radiant, godlike, unnerving sound, a stranger addresses Nier in his sister's voice. She hears how badly her replicant wants to see him again. She sees how earnestly he wants to return home with her, and she makes a decision. In celebration of her first and last moment of agency, in mockery of the Shadow Lord's pleas for her to stop, the piece enters Section C. That is the full power of the leading tone. Tension boils in the C major chord just before section C, and after a short, suspenseful rest, section C releases on F minor. The resolution here is so powerful and so earned to the point of sounding proud, but it carries a sense of dread with it because it happens on a minor chord and then goes down a fifth to another. Is this moment a triumph for Yona? or just one final insult she's being forced to suffer. The next several phrases are pretty special. So rather than continuing this start and stop routine, I'm going to let the music play for a long time and just point a few things out on screen. But here's what to pay attention to in section C. The third and fourth measures are unbelievably warm. The first phrase ends on E flat major, which is the dominant chord of the relative key A flat major, not F minor. Again, the piece tricks us into thinking it's major for just a few measures. Listen especially for the middle line in the supporting choir, and how it combines with the melody. They form such potent and major resolution that this is, cruelly, one of the most joyous progressions of the piece.
I hate to stop it there, I really do. It's the most explosive resolution in the track, but to make sure those explosives have maximum yield, I have to talk about what's going on in the orchestra and the roadmap of the piece. The track no longer flows A, B, C, D. From here forward, it sticks to this pattern. Sections A, D, and C, then a segue back to A, which then flows into B, before another segue loops it back to the very top. And the reason I made these two lowercase is that while they're unmistakably sections A and B, they're really different, as you'll hear. But the main reason I'm bringing the roadmap up is that it's significant that section D replaces section B here at the beginning. There are two massive arrival points in Shadow Lord. One is the very beginning of section B. And one is the same place in section C. They're both very powerful, but Section B has the benefit of going first in the piece, so it gets to take the listener by surprise. Section C isn't modest, though, it's introduced by a really prominent leading tone, and its entire first measure is an F minor chord. Still, by the time Section C rolls around, we're just not as impressed. But the sudden brightness here, similar to Section B's but unique, deserves its moment in the spotlight. By swapping out B for D, the piece starts with the two less exciting sections, so that the first huge arrival point we hit in this climactic orchestral mix is the top of section C. Because of all the other instruments coming in, we don't even notice the drop in energy in the chord progression, because the new voices and moving lines more than make up for it. This time, there are five layers to this arrival point. I'm repeating myself, but the previous chord is C major, with the leading tone in the melody, so it's carrying a lot of tension that needs to resolve on an F. This section begins on an F minor chord, with F in the melody. Two measures before section C, tubas enter, and they are loud. This coming version of section C is the only time we hear tubas. At all. At the same time, the trumpets build even more tension toward the tonic by playing this moving line that contains every pitch of the major dominant chord, C major, while also teasing at the tonic itself, F. This pattern showing up in this piece is pretty funny to me because it's a cliché in major keys. It's a very basic but effective way to create and resolve tension. You know where you've heard exactly this before? That's where you've heard exactly this before, and now it's part of a climactic minor key resolution. Go figure. We've heard many cymbal swells at the beginnings of periods, but in both versions of the piece with percussion, the top of section C is the first time we hear the crash cymbals actually crash. Everything is building up together in these last two measures. The whole piece blends together into one gargantuan dominant chord about to come crashing down on F minor, and then the violins come in at the last second, putting more stress on the leading tone and joining the trumpets on the second degree. The arrival on F minor at the start of section C is as big as resolution gets, and we're approaching it entirely in C major. It shouldn't sound right, but putting everything we've talked about together, we know why it does. So let's enjoy this absolutely incredible passage. gonna take a second to come out of that. All right, we've still got work to do. At the end there, the trumpets repeat the descending scale that the violins and horns played before, but they play it at half speed and accented so that it sounds like clock tower bells. Let's take another peek at the road map. Those trumpet bell tones make up this segue here, so next we have the new versions of sections A and B. The most obvious difference is that the soloist who's been singing the melody all this time isn't singing it anymore or singing at all. For once in their lives, the basses are singing the melody, and it's being doubled on strings. Most of the brass takes a break and the percussion backs off. The choir part here is brand new for this version of the piece, and it's really beautiful, but we'll hear it better in the next version, so we'll move on for now. That's right, this isn't the last version. 
you're stuck here forever. Now, as we know, the transition from section A to B is a big arrival point, so there are some big changes here. The choir backs off the melody entirely, and the trumpets take it up, giving it a royal brightness. Also, the percussion adopts this pattern that's almost a rock and roll beat, with the upbeats emphasized instead of downbeats. Yeah, really. What really gets me, though, is what the violins do next. You won't hear them right away, but they won't keep you waiting long. What was that? Well, that's the happiest little flourish I ever did here. This comes during one of the points where the piece dips into A flat major. Shocking! And that high note is E flat rather than E natural. But it still surprises me that this much cheerfulness is even possible in a minor key. Because make no mistake, this is still F minor in a larger context. It all is. Almost every cornerstone moment in Shadow Lord firmly presents F as the tonic. The few that don't are so isolated from each other that we never perceive key changes. In all the most important ways, there aren't any. As to what the violin flourish is doing in this piece, I can't say for sure. Even though pockets of major sound are a core element of Shadow Lord in all its forms, part of me wants to say that this is so bright that it crosses the line, but a bigger part of me says, hey, was I distracted by it when I played the game? No. When fighting the Shadow Lord four times to collect different endings, did I even notice the flourish was there? No, I found it when I started making this video. So shut me up, good music sounds good. After that, we segue to the top and start over from where the orchestra came in. That's the full route the piece will take for the rest of the game. It's downhill from here. When the Shadow Lord's health gets pretty low, it triggers this bittersweet cutscene where we bid farewell to Grimoire Vice. Although the tempo and roadmap stay the same, the music reverts to just the choir and organ. Now we can look at the choir parts in the new A and B sections. At first it's just the basses and tenors over the organ, which sounds downright sinister at first because of the shift in color, but check out what happens next. Everybody is singing on awe again, and to me this starts to sound less like hymnal music and more like Golden Age Disney. When the cutscene ends, the orchestra comes back in, and we arrive at the part of the fight that is technically the easiest, and emotionally the hardest. The Shadow Lord lets all of his magic loose, and all you have to do is hit him three times. Each time you do, a shockwave blasts you all the way to the back of the room. And when that happens... This is one of the most chilling moments of the game. You aren't trying to slay a monster. You're trying to kill a person. And after all he's seen and all he's lost, there is nothing left in his life but memories. The sound of a music box has long been associated with nostalgia, melancholy, and better times. Here at the end, the Shadow Lord stops focusing on the battle. His thoughts turn to the past that shouldn't have happened and the future that now never will. So, in the end, is he really beaten? Or does he just... stop? <laughs> Malevolence. Celebration. Authority. 
peace and sorrow, a character arc, final battle, and farewell. All of them are woven into this one theme. Whether by changes in roadmap and instrumentation, or just by innate nature, the same 64 measures encompass it all. There are at least two stories in every conflict. Nier probably spends the rest of his life thinking he stopped a great evil at the Shadow Lord's castle that day. And until ending A, the player has very little reason to doubt that perspective. That impression of the Shadow Lord is what the music is mainly built around. It's what Nier's quest is built around in the second half of the game. But as you continue to strip away layer after layer in both the story and this piece, you quickly realize, this is just some guy. We can't see his hope and despair beneath his frozen face, but every person has them, without exception. And if you listen carefully, you can hear them. So listen. <laughs>